In this series of videos, we are moving toward the recursion theorem. In this video, we're going to begin with a discussion of how much a program can know about itself. And we'll also talk about a program that prints out itself. Let's start with this question. Can we ever really know ourselves? And by this I mean, can we really know how many neurons we have, where they are, and how they are interconnected to each other? Well, if you think about it, your brain has a bunch of neurons, roughly 10 billion neurons. And so the question I'm asking is whether it's possible to know or remember or store in your brain somehow um, all the details about each and every neuron and all the connections between the neurons. Well, on average, we have less than one neuron per to, to use to store information about neurons. So you've got 10 billion neurons, so uh, you need to represent information about 10 billion neurons, but you've only got 10 billion neurons. Presumably, a lot of those neurons are in use for other stuff, such as remembering how to eat and sleep, and uh, if you've taken a compiler class, that would have used up a few neurons as well. Um, so, uh, and the information about each neuron that we want to store is, well, let's, let's make it very basic. Uh, perhaps we want to just give each neuron a number and just remember which other neurons a particular neuron is, is connected to via synapses. There may be a lot more information that we would uh, like to store, but just as a minimum, that would be a starting point of what we might want to store about our, uh, about our brain. But I think it stands to reason that each neuron, while it is capable of storing some information, uh, clearly, since your brain stores information, the neurons are capable of somehow storing that information, but uh, I think it's pretty obvious that each neuron is storing only a very, very small amount of, neuro of, of information. So the problem is, to capture the information about your brain, about each neuron, you're going to have to use more than one neuron. A brain, uh, and so the, the problem seems that, uh, we, it seems that we can't know our own brain, at least in detail. Um, we can also ask the same question of programs. Can a program ever know itself or internally represent itself um, or somehow process or operate on itself? And the remarkable answer that we'll see in uh, this series of videos is that the answer is yes. Let's start with a question from the earliest days of biology. Animals are born and they seem to be copies of their parents. From one animal is born a second copy. The copy is more or less an uh, accurate copy. And this was a real conundrum. How, how can the uh, m parent, how can the mother create a copy, uh, a new animal that's just like herself? Uh, so where is that information stored? Um, the, the one theory that people put forward was that every, every parent uh, contains a tiny little person inside. Every mother contains a tiny little person who, after birth, grows into a full-size individual. And then if that uh, person goes on to have uh, children, then that would, uh, it would contain another small person that would grow into a full-size person. Um, but uh, clearly, this was a not uh, a very good theory because um, the species continues apparently ad infinitum, and so does that mean that the uh, parent of a whole line of people contains little people with little people inside of them, with little people inside of them, with little people inside of them, down to infinity? So it was not really clear um, what the solution was, but uh, it was pretty clear this was not a, not a workable idea. Let's look at another domain and look at a related question. A computer virus is a program that copies itself from one computer to another. And uh, obviously, as, as part of its functioning, it has to somehow make a copy of itself. And how is it going to do this? 
uh, viruses copy the image of their executable code from one place in memory to another computer's memory or, or something like that. We can simplify our problem and try to imagine just a program that is capable of printing itself. One approach to dealing with the um, the uh, program that makes a copy of itself or prints itself is to do it like this. And here's some pseudocode. Let's walk through this. Um, let's assume that the program has a variable uh, p that's a pointer. And the first thing it does is it uh, sets that pointer to point to uh, the address of the first byte of the code. And then it loops uh, as many times as the program is big. And in each iteration of the loop, it goes out to memory using P and grabs the byte and um, prints it um, and then increments P and then repeats. And, and that would work. Um, and I should say this is, um, in a sense, is the uh, uh, solution that biology ends up using. Uh, as you can see in this program, you've got uh, memory that's being used two ways. In one way, it's being used as data. We go out to a particular byte in memory and fetch that data and then print it. But it's also being used in a second way, which is it's being executed. And in biological life, we've got DNA. And DNA is also used sort of two different ways. In one, one use, it's, it's executed as code. The DNA uh, contains information about how to build proteins, and the proteins then are what the cell is made out of, more or less. So the DNA is executed, if you will, to produce the proteins, much like uh, code is executed in a computer. And the second way DNA is used is it's used as, as data. During uh, cell replication, uh, a copy of the DNA strand is made. And so in that case, the DNA is just used as data. And uh, so biological life uses something more or less like this. But let's go back to the computer virus and consider a, a countermeasure that um, operating systems can use. Well, sometimes operating systems will flag files or memory in uh, the computer's main memory as being either executable or readable and writable. So sometimes, particularly in Unix-based systems, you see the executable flag on files. And so this is where that's coming from, and that's what it's for. The idea is a program can either be executed uh, like this, or the file can contain some data. But to prevent a virus from reading itself, we flag executables as executable only. And so we wouldn't allow a statement like this that, that goes to an area of the program and fetches that data as data, fetches the bytes as data to be used and copied. So in this way, uh, the machine, uh, possibly hard, with hardware support, can prevent all programs from, from reading themselves. So they can't read their own code. So then the question becomes, how do viruses operate? And this brings us to the recursion theorem. And we'll see that there's another way that a program can access itself. It's quite interesting. Before we describe the recursion theorem, let's create a little goal for ourselves. Let's try to write a program that is capable of printing itself out without using the approach that I described on the previous slide as approach one, where we access the code directly as data. So we need to have some sort of a um, little programming language uh, in order to do this. And we, won't, we don't need a very big programming language. And in fact, we'll have something that's quite minimal. We'll have variables, some sort of an assignment statement. Um, we'll work with strings. And we have a print statement. And this is really all we need in order to write this program. So here are some example statements. Here's an assignment statement setting x to world, and we can print strings, and we can print this variable. Okay, this is all the mechanism we need in our programming language. Not really very much. 
in order to be able to create a pro program that can print itself. And notice that uh, algorithms that are created in this little mini language are certainly as powerful as Turing machines. Uh, Turing machines have memory and in a sense the variable that's functioning is our memory here. Uh, so in a Turing machine the tape is used as a memory but in modern computers we use variables uh, which represent areas of main memory to store data. So we use variables for memory. Uh, also to make things a little bit uh, simpler uh, we will ignore the problem of printing new lines. We can just cram all of our program on one line perhaps and ignore uh, line breaks. That'll make the idea a little bit simpler. And um, when we quote things, uh, we could, let's just ignore uh, the problem of escaping quotes. So here's a string, and I'm using single quotes for strings. And this string contains a quote in it. So let's just assume that that can be parsed the way we intend it to be. Um, in many languages, such as C, we have a backslash uh, in front of certain characters so that the opening quote will match the closing quote and the, the quotes that occur within the string are not interpreted as closing quotes. This system in the first line here doesn't really work. Um, it just assumes we can understand that this quote is different than, than this quote, which of course the programming language and compiler cannot. Um, here I have the format for strings in Fortran, back in the earliest days of Fortran, strings were specified like this. Here's four o'clock, and they avoided the escape problem, but they did it in a very uh, difficult and clumsy way. H, which stood for Hollerinth, the inventor of punch cards, uh, was used as a character to indicate a string, and in front of the H was a number that indicated how many characters were in the string. So when you saw a nine H, it would immediately just interpret the next nine characters as a string constant. This was they called them Hollerinth constants because they hadn't really figured out that a string that the word string was a better better word for that. Programs that print themselves are called quines after a philosopher named Quine. So what we're going to do is write a quine. Okay, let's get going and write our program. Let's start with a very simple program that just prints out something like hello. Now there's, a, there's the entire program right there. Now let's say we want a program that will print this program. So we want a program that will print this program here. Well here's what this, that looks like. Here's our program in red, print hello. And we're surrounding in a print string. But now our program has gotten a little bit larger because of the the first print out here. And so we're not actually printing the program itself, we're printing a simpler program. So in order to print this program, we would have to have a print statement in front of it. And now we're printing out this program with this program. And to print out this program, of course, we'd have to add uh, yet another print statement. And you can see that this is not going to lead to a solution. Uh, we can't print out ourselves with a finite string using this general approach. Now let's try a different approach to creating a program that will print itself out. And this approach will work, unlike the previous approach. We've got assignment, state, assignment statements in our language, so uh, let's imagine that we've got an assignment statement in our program, and we've got print statements. So here we're setting x to some string and then we're printing it. Uh, we don't really care what the string is, I'll come back to that in a moment. Now let's try to print this program out. Let's start with printing the assignment statement out. So st step two is to add some additional code uh, that will print the assignment statement out. So uh, here we've got that stuff right here. So we're saying print x gets quote, so we're printing x gets quote, and then we've got some stuff here in green, don't know what it is, but whatever it is, it's stored in variable x, so we can print it out simply by printing x. And finally we need to print the closing quote. 
So we print the closing quote here. Now, in the next step, here's our program, more or less. We're not quite done with it. We'll add uh, one more print statement to it. So uh, let's just add that print statement. And what we'd like to do is the, the, the first three print statements print out the assignment statement. Okay? But we're not done printing out the program. We've still got all the stuff that's in green, that's uh, in this green dashed line. Well, we can add a print statement here and print all that stuff out as long as what's between these quotes here is exactly the same as what's surrounded by the dashed green line. So here's our program. What we're going to do is we're going to take all these characters, print, quote x gets, quote, quote, print x, print, quote, 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 print x, all those characters, and we're going to put them right here where the green is. Okay. So now let's see what we do. We'll, when we execute this program, we'll assign x to something. We'll print x gets, quote, and then we'll print whatever is x is right here, and then we'll print the closing quote, and then we'll print x again. And as long as x is the stuff surrounded by this dashed green line, we would print it. So here's our final program. And uh, we see that I've just copied the material that was in that dashed green line and put it right in here. Okay, So you can see it's exactly the same. Print, print x, quote, x gets, quote, quote, print x, print x, print, quote, 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 print, quote, 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 print x, print x. So everything that's here goes in here. Now let's try executing this thing. Okay, so we're going to execute it. So the first thing we do is we do the assignment statement. There's no output for that, but x is now assigned to this string. The next thing is we uh, execute this. Um, we execute the first print statement, which says x gets quote. And so we print out in blue x gets quote. And the next thing we do is print x. Well, we know what x is. x is all this stuff here. So we just print it out right here. Print x. And this is exactly the same material as here. So we print that out. And then in the next line, we print the closing quote. So you see that here is the closing quote. And finally, we print x. So x is print x gets. So we, we print quote x gets quote quote, then we print print x, and then we have print quote quote quote, which we print here, and then finally print x. So this shows the output of our program, and this is the program itself, and you can see that they are identical. Just for fun, let's uh, look at this Quine program expressed in the C programming language. If you're not interested in this or you don't know the C language, uh, feel free to skip the rest of this video and move on to the next one. But if you do know C, let me uh, remind you that the ASCII character value 34 is just equal to the double quote character. And in C, uh, we print things out with a statement called printf. And a printf statement has a string, okay, in double quotes, such as hello. And in the string, you can have these embedded formatting instructions. Uh, they start with percent, and C means insert a character, and S means insert a string. So what this will do is print the letters H-E-L-L-O, uh, I guess there's a space there, and then a character, and then a string, and then a character. And then the remaining arguments to the printf statement are the values that are substituted for these formatting codes here. So 34, that's a double quote. S is the string world, okay, world, and then another double quote. So when, ex when you execute this printf statement, the output you'll see is hello 
double quote, world, double quote. Okay, given that that's, that, that that's what we have, here is our Quine program. Okay, uh, every program starts with main, parenthesis, brace, and ends with brace, so ignore that. Of course, we have to print that out, but ignore it. Now, here we have a, a, a here's our variable x. Okay, it's a string variable, which is a care pointer. Okay, and here is the thing in green, okay, which I'm not going to show you. And then with C, we can, we can do it all very quickly with a one print statement. Uh, we need to print X twice, so here we see X occurring twice. And to deal with our double quotes, we have the code for double quotes. So what we're going to do is we're going to print the string X, which may contain, which we assume will contain, some escape characters like this. And then we have the information for what is to be printed for each of those. So now what we do is substitute for this green this material right here. And what is this material? Well, it's we need the characters main, parenthesis, open brace, care star, x equals. And so that's what we have in this green part right here. I'm separating it out because it's uh, kind of confusing, but what we're going to do is write all of these characters between the double quotes. Okay, so main parenthesis, brace, care, star, x, gets. And in order to print out the program, at that point we print our double quotes and then we print x again. So here we see our formatting character, uh, formatting codes, c for character, s for string, c for character. So that prints out the double quote, this material here, and then another double quote, and then we keep printing with a semicolon, printf x 34 x 34, close print, semicolon, and closing brace. So when you substitute these characters into where it's green, you get a program in C which will print itself out.